Okay, hello everybody. Uh, good morning, and it's it's good to be here. Unfortunately, it's a it's a bit of a drizzly day here in in County Leash, uh, but looking forward to uh, seeing everybody at some stage out in the field. Uh, my my name is Mark McCurry. I am the ecology manager in Board Nimona. I am also the joint vice county recorder for County Leash, along with my wife uh, Fiona McGowan. So I'm here today as part of my uh, job in Board Nimona. I've been an ecologist for 12 years. Uh, my uh, first role in Board Nimona was to do a baseline survey of Board Nimona properties. Uh, Board Nimona owns about 80,000 hectares of peatland. I could confidently say I've walked across three quarters of those peatlands. And I want to talk about uh, some of the plants that I've seen along the way. Uh, and some of the ecology I've seen along the way, and uh, and just the changes I've I've seen as well. Okay, uh, look, a good starting point here uh, in relation to border mona bogs is uh, the raised bog in the Midlands. Like we know, it can't be restored in the short term in many sites, and that's because. The majority of the peat mass has been removed uh, for uh, peat extraction. Uh, this is for uh, energy, for growing media, for a fuel. And the environmental conditions of many of these sites have changed radically. Uh, but sure, as we'll see in the talk, uh, uh, you know, Bordemona properties or bogs, it can be quite variable. So we do have a lot of different conditions on these sites. Uh, but I'm really going to focus on some of these bogs where the majority of peat has been cut away and talk about some of the plants that we see in these bogs. So like you may wonder, you know, why, why talk about plants and board pneumonia bogs? And look, everybody uh, is probably familiar with some of the board pneumonia extraction sites. There are these vast areas of of uh, burr peat, um, brown deserts, as they were called, and uh, not really a place to go looking for plants. And uh, like everybody's familiar with, you know, uh, sites like these, uh, you know, sites that were in milled peat extraction for over fifty years, and uh, and it just it just reflects, uh, you know, the history of Board Nimona in relation to uh, some of these bogs that were. Uh, utilized for their uh, peat and uh, you know that peat was used then you know you know for power stations to gener generate generate um, electricity uh, and so on but as these bogs became cut away uh, you know like generally these bogs would have a you know a lifespan in terms of um, peat production terms of about um, 50 years and some of these bogs in the 1980s you know they started to be uh cut away and peat extraction stopped and nature and colonization began. And in these areas, we start to see uh, plants appearing again and start to see uh, pioneer vegetation communities developing. So to understand about uh, uh, habitats, pioneer habitats in Borden and Monobogs and uh, uh, um, the plants that we might see in some of these habitats, it's good to understand how, how these raised bogs uh, developed. So obviously, like, uh, these raised bogs in the Midlands, they developed um, after the last glaciation, you know, approximately 10,000 years ago. Uh, and af after those glaciers, uh, that ice mass melted, we had a lot of shallow lakes um, through the Midlands. Uh, these lakes, uh, you know, uh, alluvial deposits would have developed at the base of these lakes. And then these lakes would have uh, gradually transformed swamps. Uh, they would have developed peat forming conditions and they would have developed as, as fen uh, initially. And then as these, as these fens developed, they then switched to uh, uh, umbrotrophic conditions. Remember, uh, fens are fed by groundwater, uh, raised bogs. That's where uh, they switch to uh, uh, rainwater um, influence. And, and these raised bogs um, developed through the Midlands. And then Bordemona came along and you know, started to uh, develop these bogs, drain these bogs and, and use them for peat extraction. 
and that reduced uh, the the depth of peat, and uh, you know that continued in some cases, uh, particularly for loose bogs along the Shannon. Uh, the levels uh, were reduced below the gravity drainage line, and these bogs required pump drainage. And obviously, that has a, a big impact on on what happens when uh, you know pumps get turned off. But this means that we have a suite of environmental conditions, uh, and some sometimes these can be he um, quite heterogeneous. And uh, like a key, the key environmental factors here are the the new water chemistry, and this tends to be alkaline. It, it's because it's influenced by the underlying uh, glacial deposits and uh, that are uh, generally limestone based, and also by these alluvial deposits, which also are, are quite alkaline and uh, uh, are you know are, are made up of of lacustrine marls. Uh, other key environmental factors would be um, residual peat depths uh, and you know and and hydrology. So generally, we see uh, uh, general uh, environmental um, ranges, you know, going from kind of dry areas uh, to wet areas. But a key point here is that in these sort of conditions, we're not going to see uh, where the majority of peat is cut away. We're not going to see raised box sphagnums uh, developing um, soon. Uh, but what we can see is we can see these other uh, habitats redeveloping. So. In some respects, you know, the cutaway that we see emerging now, it's almost like a like a young uh, raised bog uh, that's gone back to its toddler years or, or you know, and uh, it's starting to redevelop again. Uh, and then, you know, we see the vegetation um, starting to develop uh, and the vegetation that starts to develop really reflects uh, those underlying um, characteristics. So I'm going to really focus uh, on these areas where uh, the majority of peat has been extracted. So if we go out onto these bogs, uh, particularly in wet conditions, we see vast areas, uh, you know, that can be dominated by bog cotton uh, or could be dominated by, you know, other species like um, common bottle sedge. And in, in relation to these pioneer communities, they are frequently dominated by, by single species. And... Uh, and this is very much a, a pioneer situation. Uh, here's an example of a bog down in County Tipperary, and we see, uh, you know, the bog cotton emerging. Uh, you know, there, there's a bit of bottle sedge there. We can see the majority of peat is cut away, and um, the subsoil, um, the subsoil, is being exposed. But, you, you know, like this area would have been bare peat, um, you know, 10 to 15 years ago, and. Uh, you know, so this this is changing um, quite you know rapidly, and it's uh, and it, <clears throat> and uh, like a key point here is that like the water levels can fluctuate as well, uh, so that obviously has a, a big Im impact or influence on the development of the of the vegetation here. But what's interesting is like while we get you know these areas of ball cotton. Uh, and bottle sedge. Uh, we, we also get uh, other species that would be indicative of fan situations such as black bog rush or, or yellow sedges. And all these, like these species are, are again, they're very indicative of, of fan-like situations and obviously reflecting the more calcareous um, substrate uh, in relation to the fan peat and the influence of the, of the alkaline um, um, water chemistry. Uh, black bog, uh, black bog rush, um, rush would be, you know, somewhat uncommon, uh, but it is appearing uh, across, like at several um, locations across the cutaway. And some of these species are, are, uh, are slower to colonize, and that probably reflects uh, seed, um, natural just colonization of seed, and the fact that uh, they are um, poor. Um, um, colonizers and, and slower to um, naturally um, distribute across the, the environment. So why, you know, again, you know, we can ask the question, why are we talking about um, fan conditions and not ball conditions? And a big influence is this, is this moral. Uh, you know, it, it generally is called shell moral. And this is lacustrine. It was deposited, you know, 
when these areas were shallow lakes. And you can see the shells of the little mollusks that uh, used to live in, in these lake situations. And uh, this means that the, the water chemistry is quite, quite alkaline. Uh, you're up to uh, and pHs of, you know, round sevens, you know, sometimes even higher than seven. And this means that, uh, you know, you're going to get a suite of, of, of species that, that are indicative of these um, fan um, um, characteristics. Um, one key species uh, or one interesting species is the appearance of sausage. And uh, uh, Michael Jacob would tell a story of, you know, uh, noticing the first clump of sausage appearing in Lunnymore wetland, uh, you know, about 20 years ago. And now uh, it's quite um, readily distributed across that wetland, that cutaway wetland in Lunnymore. And now these um, clumps of sausage are starting to uh, um, coalesce and start, start starting to form these areas dominated by sausage. And like this is uh, obviously uh, very interesting because uh, sausage, you know, uh, you may be familiar with it from, uh, you know, sites like Pollard's Town where we get large areas dominated by sausage. And they are uh, a particular habitat that is um, um, a priority habitat uh, under the EU Habitats Directive. So, you know, what's interesting is, you know, will, will similar analogous habitats develop on the board of Mona cutaway in time? And again, uh, you know, sausage, like while, like, it, you know, it would be considered uncommon on the cutaway, it now is found right across the Midlands, you know, from Offaly uh, right across to uh, uh, Amherst Common um, over near Ban the Slow. And uh, we're starting to see it, uh, you know, appear uh, more and more. So here, here we have, uh, a stand of sausage developing at Lullymore. And again, these are areas of, uh, um, this is an area where um, clumps of sausage have coalesced. And like in time, like I would expect these sites to change and this um, vegetation to become more dominant. What other species uh, are, uh, you know, characteristic of these fan-like situations? Well, across the bogs, uh, these cutaway bogs, we see a lot of um, orchids, uh, such as marsh hellebrine. Uh, you know, this really nice, um, pretty orchid. And like I was delighted to see this across the cutaway because like species like this in County Leash are, you know, quite rare now. Uh, we don't have that many um, sites. Uh, with um, species like marsh hellebrine. But now, like across the board in Mona Cutaway, you know, uh, you're going to see, uh, like the, you know, I'm not surprised to see marsh hellebrine in, in the summertime. Uh, the marsh orchids uh, across the Cutaway are, are fascinating. And what's interesting is uh, these, these marsh orchids and other species of orchids, they do seem to colonize the Cutaway quite readily. And obviously reflecting, you know, the fact that uh, there's uh, the habitat, um, um, suits these species in terms of um, wetness and so on, and uh, uh, nutrient conditions and alkalinity. Obviously, the nutrient con um, conditions would be quite low, but but these um, these species are obviously um, colonizing by via seed as well, and uh, you know the Dactyliza um, species. What's interesting about the marsh orchids is we get several different varieties um, across our, our, our cutaway as well. Uh, we get incarnata, um, subspecies incarnata. We also get um, su subspecies pulchera. And uh, this lovely uh, uh, orchid in the middle, it's, it's subspecies cochinea, uh, which is the, the, the red or the brick red species that's more commonly associated with um, sand dunes along our coastline. So really interesting to see it pop up, popping up on these cutaway sites that were once raised bogs, but now have uh, a radically different environment. Uh, we get other fan species, uh, you know, species like common butterwort, uh, the lesser butterfly orchid, it tends to be more indicative of, you know, um, slightly more um, acidic situations. Uh, and like this is another, another lovely uh, marsh orchid, Dactyliza transternioides. And like while a lot of the species we see across the cutaway are, 
are 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 readily uh, quite common. Uh, we are seeing um, some species that are rare in the in the wider landscape. This would be one of those species. It's a red, you know, red databoot species, um, typical of fans, and is starting to pop up um, across the cutaway. And it's just like it's really pretty orchid. Another species that you know was you know really interesting to find uh, was uh, round leaf wintergreen. Uh, I got really excited when I found this in uh, Mount Lucas Wind Farm um, one evening. And uh, what was interesting is uh, when I went down and, and went back and checked uh, the records, this hadn't been recorded in awfully before. Like we did know it was uh, uh, it was present at 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 Lullymore in County Kildare. Uh, but now here it was in Offaly, and uh, subsequently we found it on on four more uh, bogs, cutaway bogs in uh, eastern eastern County Offaly on the cutaway, and no doubt it's going to turn up on on more sites, and uh, it can it can be quite abundant as well. Like there's tons of it in in Mount Lucas in the cutaway, uh, in the, in those areas uh, that um, surround um, the wind farm. This is uh, the typical habitat. It's it's you know nothing to uh, nothing special. You know it's quite scrubby. It's uh, you know the water levels would be uh, close to the peat surface. You know it could be dry during the summertime. Uh, you could be um, squelching around in in the winter time. Uh, there wouldn't be that much peat. So like uh, you. Know, like what's interesting is, you know, some of these rare species that would be rare in the wider landscape, they're not too fussy when it comes to the cutaway and they can be found in, in different situations. Uh, we see other fen species and wetland species, uh, species like a uh, bog thistle uh, is uh, quite common, um, common mint. Uh, and, you know, like this is a particularly interesting species, alder buckthorn. And uh, what's interesting about uh, seeing alder buckthorn was, uh, when I first started to see it, you know, we were asking the question, where are these relic um, trees or bushes, like were they kind of relics of uh, the previous raised bogs and, and previous raised bog flushes? Uh, but looking at their distribution, uh, looking where they are present and looking at the at the, the plants that are now appearing, uh, they are colonizing and they are colonizing on the, on the cutaway, particularly at, at, at Lullymore. Uh, where there would be a locally frequent um, population uh, that's, you know, that's really following the, the River Fijal uh, uh, um, catchment. Uh, it's, it's quite locally frequent in that area, but we're also seeing it um, on other sites and it's slow to spread, but it is spreading. Uh, we're seeing this at, at Boar as well. And again, like this, uh, this is another rare species like in County Leash, uh, like only three uh, known sites um, um, currently. So really nice to see this um, species doing well on the cutaway. It's not all about the flowering plants as well. Like we do see um, lots of different grasses and sedges. Uh, the more common sedges would be obviously Carex rostrata, um, Carex panacea. Uh, uh, you know, we get occasional, um, you know, Carex paniculata, the, um, the greater tussock sedge. Uh, but what's really interesting is uh, coming across these uh, rare sedges, um, Carex alata, uh, the, the tufted sedge, or, or even, uh, you know, the cypress sedge, Carex um, pseudocypress. And like, this is a new species to us. Uh, it was um, just recorded last year by um, Kieran Byrne in uh, um, Omersbog as, as part of a biodiversity survey he was doing for a local community group. Uh, and again, it just highlights the fact that uh, new species are appearing all the time and also highlights the fact that in terms of survey effort, you know, sometimes you walk past these plants and you assume that there may be one species when, in fact, uh, there's obviously more diversity here. And uh, like once this was highlighted to us, uh, you know, some of the ecologists on the team, you know, David Nicholas, uh, was able to um, find it at several other bogs. And again, it's just it was because we were we were starting to look out for it. And so what's really interesting is that, you know, again, these, these species are indicative of fan conditions and probably indicative of the fan habitats that are going to develop on these sites again. It's not all about um, uh, the, the sedges and so on. 
Uh, we also have a lot of uh, other indicators of fan, um, such as the brown mosses. Uh, these are starting to appear in some of our sites. They're not frequent. Uh, they would be uh, you know, scarce in terms of their abundance, but they are there uh, and nice to see. And you know, this is a great, great example of a site, like a you know, a site that's just going to develop as fan. Here we can see uh, this area; it's dominated by stoneworts. You can see the calcareous precipitation, uh, the whiteness uh, precipitating out on the plants, uh, and there's actually some uh, Juncus subnodulosus, another uh, fan, typical fan species, rich fan species in the background there. And again, great to see these species colonized in the cutaway. Remember, this was once spur peat. And what's interesting here as well is this area would have been planted with conifers uh, back in the day <clears throat> as part of you know, um, um, developing um, different land uses. But this area, it got wet. Uh, sure, it was spring fed and influenced by the underlying um, marls. And sure, it's developing this fantastic and fen habitat that's just going to continue to diversify in time. So moving on, I'm going to now talk about a, a different habitat. I'm going to talk about calcareous grassland. And again, what's interesting here is, you know, some of this calcareous grassland, again, this is developing in areas that were once raised bog. So these are, these tend to be areas of, of glacial material and mounds or ridges that were overlain with peat when uh, the raised bogs were developed. But now with board pneumonia taking the peat away and harvesting peat, uh, these new um, um, areas of glacial material are now exposed. And it, like, the vegetation that's developing on them, it's very much analogous to what we would see on calcareous grassland and, and on eskers. And it, it can be quite diverse um, floristically and obviously quite good for um, pollinators, butterflies and bees and so on. And just to, to demonstrate this, you know, here's here's a site. Uh, we look at the old maps, uh, at Clongo, Clongoni Moor. Uh, all all of this, uh, you know, is indicating uh, it was raised bog back in the in the 19th century. We look at it now, or back in 2000, we can see mostly um, um, burr peat. Uh, this is when uh, peat extraction was at its height. Uh, there was an area of conifer um, plantation there developing in the, uh, as soon as the bottom right hand corner. Uh, but we can see some of these mounds, these kind of wider areas starting to develop. And this is where the peat has been cut away and the mounds are being exposed. And now we can see this has been, uh, uh, you know, in 2020, uh, we see a lot more pioneer vegetation cover and we see these mounds starting to develop. Um, older habitats, these pioneer calcareous habitats. And so we see a typical suite of, of species on these um, um, dry calcareous areas. And again, we, you know, lovely species like, um, you know, the, the field scabious, um, ladies' bed straw, and, and Caroline thistle. Uh, and again, all these species have naturally colonized into these cutaway bogs uh, from um, nearby donor sites. And uh, again, like if we think about um, peat in some of these areas, it would be very little peat, like we're really down to the exposed um, subsoil. Uh, we get other uh, um, typical indicator species such as um, quaking grass or yellow rattle, um, cat's ear uh, and so on. Uh, again, just highlighting the, the, the diversity of these sites. Uh, other, other species, you know, uh, um, columbine uh, would be, uh, again, um, locally frequent or, you know, like a not uncommon. Um, and then really interesting species such as, as creeping willow, you know, and again, really indicating that uh, the environment of these sites has radically changed. Like we're seeing, you know, again, calcium loving species uh, appearing in areas that were once raised bog and acidic. Uh, we get species like um, birds with trefoil, which, uh, you know, uh, you know, um, butterfly species such as dingy skipper and, and common blue um, um, depend on as a food plant. And again, like really interesting to see species like dingy skipper start um, colonizing cutaway bogs. And again, this is a species uh, or is typical of calcareous grassland and is now in an area that was once 
and formerly Rizbul. We get uh, areas where uh, common spotted orchids would be um, quite, um, quite dominant. And again, you can see it in a mosaic here uh, with birch scrub. Uh, we get other orchid species typical of, of these dry areas, such as uh, the common twig blade or pyramidal orchids. Uh, this is a lovely um, white variety uh, we, we spotted uh, on one of our bogs. And we also get um, bee orchid as well. And again, really interesting to see that, you know, this is naturally colonizing um, via seed, uh, and probably windblown seed. And here, like what's interesting here is that at this particular site uh, near Longford Pass in County Tipperary, we have uh, found these two um, varieties of, of bee orchid. Uh, these are um, varieties that have um, very um, specific characteristics. They have uh, much paler um, petals, uh, either um, um, yellow or uh, um, pale green petals. Uh, we have uh, a subspecies called um, um, Flaviansis. And then we also have a variety um, called um, Chloranthia. And these, you know, these were highlighted to us by um, John Fogarty. And what's interesting is they, these have colonized in a railway cut in the banks of this railway cut in that Longford Pass. And again, uh, again, like this, this was, uh, this is a kind of a, a transformed landscape. And uh, like, but bee orchids will disappear where there is um, sandy or, or, or gravelly um, conditions. Here's some uh, calcareous grassland, uh, you know, that's developed at Loch Bora uh, in the Bora Discovery Park. And uh, this is, uh, you know, like the way it looks um, later in the season uh, in, in July and August. And obviously it's quite um, rich in flowers and, and really um, good for um, um, bees and so on. And great to see this uh, type of grassland re redeveloping again. I know we've lost um, so much of this habitat in, in the wider landscape. And uh, I suppose we, we do need to consider, you know, we see these habitats now, uh, but they're always changing. And at Clongoni Moor, uh, you know, is a good example of what's going to happen next. Like in the background here, we can see some blackthorn um, thickets and we can see hazel behind that. And in Clongoni Moor, what's interesting is we had these uh, so-called dairies where uh, we have mounds of glacier material that were never covered in peat uh, during the development of the bogs. And so they developed uh, oak, ash, um, um, woodland. Uh, they were, uh, the, the larger trees were felled and we see the secondary woodland redeveloping with hazel and ash uh, and blackthorn and so on. And you can see the, the calcareous grass in the foreground. And if, you know, like, you know, given enough time, um, we would expect some of these glacial um, mounds and ridges to redevelop uh, this, uh, um, calcareous woodland again with hazel and uh, you know dominant and, and hopefully oak in time. So moving on, uh, looking at uh, you know a somewhat different habitat. Like I know I like I previously said that majority of border mona um, cut away. The majority of peat has been is has been cut and like we don't get these acidic habitats developing uh, uh, with um, these characteristics uh, acidic species. But in some cases, we still have quite deep residual peat and we would be hopeful that we will get uh, these acidic um, species um, colonizing again. So like you will see uh, hearse tail ball cotton and, and heather if you go across the cutaway, particularly like these species um, colonize quite readily. But we haven't seen species like bog rosemary or cranberry on, our, on the board Mona cutaway again, particularly in the industrial harvested areas. And look, it's probably a reflection of the fact that these species are slower to colonize. I have seen cranberry on, in cutover bog at, at sites like Abbey Leaks bog. So it will colonize where there are donor sites and where the, the environment suits. Uh, but like it is going to take more time and and hopefully what we will see is like if we can get the hydrology rights, we will get this lovely sphagnum rich vegetation, these this carpet of sphagnum appearing, uh, uh, you know, across this these deeper residual peat areas. And if we can get the conditions right in time, species like bog rosemary and cranberry will reappear. 
Uh, we also see a lot of um, um, devil's spit scabious. Obviously, uh, this is the food plant for Marsh artillery. Uh, I'm sure the first time you know we discovered Marsh artillery in the cutaway, we were really excited. Obviously, this is a rare butterfly species, the only protected butterfly species uh, in Europe, in, in Ireland. And uh, but now, like we're we're finding, uh, like it's 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 you know it's starting to spread across our cutaway. So we would have uh, perhaps over twenty five different sites uh, where we've uh, now recorded marsh artillery. So really good to see, uh, you know, a species that is considered rare and protected and scarce in the wider landscape starting to use the cutaway. Uh, it's amazing what you can come across, uh, like if you get out on, uh, on board the monobogs. Uh, this is just a, a field trip that was uh, took place in um, 2014. What's interesting is our president-elect, uh, Micheline, was on this field trip, uh, serpentipulously. Uh, Faith Wilson, uh, many of you might know Faith, uh, she picked up a leaf uh, and showed it to myself and, and Micheline. I thought it was bilberry. Uh, Micheline knew better uh, and said, no, uh, I think we should, you should have a look at that again. And it turned out to be uh, serrated wintergreen, um, Orphelia uh, uh, um, secunda. And again, this is a really rare uh, species in Ireland. Like it was considered extinct in the Republic of Ireland for um, some time. Uh, and what's interesting is it was like it was recorded at the Bordemona Pulla bog in the past, and Bordemona would have harvested, drained and harvested that bog. And so, uh, you know, that we would have lost uh, our philia um, from that site. But now it's appeared at, at Ballydangan bog, and uh, it seems to be uh, I'm doing I'm quite well. Like, like this is a you know, typical habitat. Uh, it's in amongst uh, the heather here in, in some of these kind of flushed areas. I don't know if you can see uh, some of the leaves popping out in that picture on the on the left hand side, just at the, at the bottom of the screen. That's the, uh, the winter green there. And uh, look, there's, there's probably more than 50 plants at this site. And, uh, you know, Bordemont have restored this bog now. We've blocked the drains. Uh, this bog is rewetting and look hopefully this is going to uh, make this site more resilient and we're going to see uh, you know our like our philia doing well on this site and just you know i'm coming to the um the end now of, of my talk but just to talk about uh, some of the work board and owner are doing and, and some of the changes we might see in the future uh, this is just a picture of kelly's grove bog uh, uh, from last year uh, this again would be a drained bog that was never really utilized for peat extraction. So it was drained and uh, it, it, it was degraded for um, some time. But now we're, we're able to re-wet these bogs. And, uh, uh, and in time, like we'll see raised bog restoration, the restoration of, of active raised bog habitats at these sites. And for me, for someone like me who's been working on board Nimona and seen these changes, uh, you know, uh, from when we were in peat extraction mode, you know, 10 years ago to now, now that we've stopped peat extraction, I'm focusing on, on restoration. And here we have four diggers uh, uh, working on this bog. This is just, you know, really exciting. This is just another example. This is Omeris bog. Uh, again, you can see some of the rewetting that was carried out last year. Uh, obviously, there's been more peat extraction at this bog, uh, there's been a you know a longer history, you know, probably peat extraction for uh, the guts of 40 years. Uh, but again, you can see we're you know we're blocking the drains, we're putting in this bonding here, and like the key objective is trying to rewet the residual peat, and you know create these kind of wet soggy conditions for uh, habitats, these wet peatland habitats to redevelop again. Peat. <clears throat> um, rehabilitation and, and, and restoration, it does take time. And, and sometimes you might look at these bogs and not think that they're, you know, they're changing um, very much. But if you compare uh, aerial photographs, you can see these changes now. And we have a great uh, you know, suite of aerial um, photography now. And the Derry Brat bog, which is close to uh, um, Bora uh, in 2000, um, this bog was mostly in peat extraction. You can see it's it's mostly bare peat. Um, some of the subsoil is starting to appear. 
but by 2020, it is now, uh, you know, revegetated. And like peat extraction only ceased uh, in around 2014 at this bog. So it shows, you know, in time, uh, maybe from year to year, the bog uh, doesn't look like it's changing, but in time, like we will see uh, pioneer vegetation developing and pioneer habitats uh, then continuing to develop. And, you know, this is what we're going to see uh, in the future, uh, lots more of, of these wet um, habitats, uh, these wet um, peatland habitats with reed, swamp and fen appearing. And uh, like it's going to be a, a, like a, a fantastic landscape, a real uh, mosaic of, of, of different um, um, habitats, obviously reflecting these underlying conditions, reflecting drier areas and, and wetter areas and areas where we have um, different um, depths of residual peat. Uh, but it's like this, this, you know, this new landscape is going to emerge and it's just a slowly but surely um, going to continue to develop. And again, like the round leaf wintergreen is probably like a good good species just to come back to. Like this was a really you know exciting species to find. Uh, but you know what else is going to come next, and you know what else is uh, like already there that we don't know about. I suppose I've been lucky enough. I've been privileged, uh, you know, to join Board Nimona when I did, uh, and and join Board Nimona towards the end of uh, you know peat extraction. Like we were you know, harvesting uh, peat probably from 20,000 hectares, you know, when I joined in, in, in 2009. But that, you know, began to dwindle and dwindle and now we've stopped. Uh, and, and now we're focused, focused on rehabilitation and restoration and obviously moving to, you know, looking to other land uses such as uh, renewable energy. But for me, you know, I could be, you know, naively optimistic or hopelessly optimistic. But for me, these changes, you know, like, like I would be very positive and optimistic about the future, you know, like it, it, it shows me that, you know, nature doesn't really need that much help. Uh, you know, it just, it needs to be, uh, you know, given a little bit of a helping hand and like our, our vision, like, uh, you know, for these um, cutaway peatlands is, you know, trying to recreate these um, wet um, soggy habitats. And you know, once we can manipulate hydrology, it's really up to you know natural colonization and to do the rest. And so far, uh, we're seeing like a real diversity of different species and, and different habitats developing. So just to finish, uh, uh, if you want to get out and, and see some of these sites, uh, we do have some sites that are open to the public. Uh, you can go and visit Lockboard Discovery Park, uh, Mount Lucas um, Wind Farm. It's a really interesting site, uh, particularly the old gravel pit. Uh, you can go and visit um, Ballydangan Bog or, or Derry Ounce, um, north of Port Arlington, which is known as Costa del Sod because of the, uh, the, the beach of, and the sand uh, that was exposed uh, when, a, when a, the peat was cut away a lake created. And uh, one of my favourite sites would be Loch Duravella down in County Tipperary. Again, this was a, a lake that was created, uh, like a lot of the marl was dug out of the lake uh, and spread out. And now this, you know, serendipitously has created this fantastic and um, diverse grassland habitat. So uh, I'll end my talk there and, and thanks very much.